We have over 80 RSVPs for the call today. It looks like we're approaching 50 participants. We're one minute past. So we're gonna go ahead. If, if all of our facilitators are ready, we'll go ahead and get started. All right. So welcome to today's discussion. Our, our topic today is um, it's academic integrity in a virtual environment. And I'm very happy to introduce our three co-facilitators. We have Anne-Marie Thomas from the University of St. Thomas, Aaron Hensley from Wake Forest University, and Rainan McClanahan from the University of Wisconsin Platteville. And each of them will give a brief overview. They'll introduce themselves, give a brief overview of of their perspectives on academic integrity in the environment we find ourselves in today. And after those overviews, we'll open the, the floor for discussion. If you have any questions during the presentations or, or even throughout the rest of the call, go ahead and add them in the chat. Uh, and I'll make sure that they, they get addressed either through the chat or through a conversation. And uh, if you have some tips to share, please, by all means, share those uh, your perspectives and resources as ah. well. So we'll go ahead and get started. If everyone, if you're not actively speaking, go ahead and mute, mute your line. All right. Anne-Marie, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, greetings, like I said, from the front entryway of my house, which is not where I thought I'd be teaching this semester, and I suspect many of you are in similar positions. Um, I am an engineering professor uh, at the University of St. Thomas. Um, I'm also a professor in the School of Business in our entrepreneurship department, um, and I teach in our engineering education program as well. So I'm lucky that in between my six classes a year, I get to teach in-service teachers, I get to teach business students, and I get to teach engineering students. Um, and I, I have a hunch I know why I was asked to speak about speak on this panel. Um, which is that I've maybe been a little outspoken on this one, which is as someone who has been teaching online for a couple of years, this is not online teaching this semester. This is crisis schooling. As many of us know, to put one of our classes online, it typically takes months and a ton of research and a ton of prep, not leaving it overnight, thinking you're coming back in a week and realizing that you're now running your labs and your, your classes online. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I can share it. I wrote up my thoughts for, for a lot of um, my colleagues because I've also been running a support group for international teachers for the last six weeks, uh, once or twice a day, a half hour Zoom call where PK through college professors get together. You're all invited, I'll share a link just to share what's working and what doesn't work for half an hour every morning and kind of just affirm that we're like, we're all in this together. And one of the things that I, I honestly was disappointed with was people starting to worry about how students are going to cheat. And I've been in a lot of discussions about cheating, uh, particularly among engineering professors. And, and the immediate solution that has seemed to be, you know, make students turn on their Zoom screens and record their lectures. And, and I'd, I'd kind of beg everyone to take a little bit of grace this semester. And this is a chance for us to teach our students what trust is. Um, I, I actually just had my research meeting and I have about 30 research students who work for me, all virtually right now, and they're all undergrads. And I asked them um, what they would like me to pass on to professors. And one of them just took an exam and it was proctored on Zoom. So they had to have their Zoom on. The professor forgot that they were recording everybody and then sent that out to everybody afterwards. And she felt so violated to have an hour of her taking a test sent to all of her classmates with the camera there, um, which was a good reminder to me. Also that honestly, a lot of our students, they did not sign up to be online right now. I have students who are taking classes during a trailer with many family members and not wanting to show everyone where they're living. Um, so I, everyone's case is different. And to my friends who are medical professors and are giving licensing exams, that's, that's, that's one thing. But for my engineering graphics exams, I, I am willing to take that leap of faith and tell my students why I'm trusting them this semester and asking them to, as many research, research has shown, sign a statement saying like, this work is mine. I've taken two hours. If that's what it was, I haven't talked to anybody. But also giving them my text number that, you know, if you run into problems, call me. If you run into but I don't know which of my students are sick right now, which has been the case for some of them. I don't know which of my students are dealing with family. So I, I would say there's two issues to talk about right now is that how do we teach online and how do we teach online during a crisis suddenly? And I would say the academic integrity has the same questions. How do we build academic integrity online? How do we compassionately handle the fact that people are dying all around the world and our students are scared and watching their friends and family is sick or losing jobs? And how can we as educators model compassion and trust um, in a way that doesn't undermine academic integrity, but that's my, maybe my, my um, 
I know it's, I'm not getting good advice on which software to use because I'm not using any software. Um, I, I instead have met with every single one of my students at least twice in the last three weeks and just asked them how things are going and discussed why I trust them to take the tests truthfully. And if they run into problems, call me. Um, so that's, that's, that's my take, which I know doesn't give any quick solutions, but it's, it's my plea for compassion and humanity and how we as a profession right now can, by instilling faith in our students, um, really help them see their better natures. And there has been a lot of academic research on the power of having trust statements uh, on exams, and we can look up those papers. Um, so maybe I'm a plea for please don't turn on their cameras and let you watch them take a test. Um, that's a really big added stress right now. And back to you, Jim. Thank you, Anne Marie. Erin, it looks like you are set and ready to go next in the overview. Uh, sure, sure. Um, so my name is Erin Hensley. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Wake Forest in the Department of Engineering. Um, and um, I think I got asked to uh, help out today just because I would probably say yes. So <laughs> um, so I, I'm by no means um, an, an expert on, on this topic. Um, but one of the things that I've really kind of taken to heart within the situation that we're in is, you know, in this transition to the online kind of crisis teaching mode, we, we've also had to sort of reevaluate our courses, right, reevaluate our learning outcomes, reevaluate how we're going to assess those learning outcomes. And I think there's a lot of potential for better practices, you know, even when we return to in, you know, in person teaching. Um, and so when you look at a lot of the literature behind, you know, practices that reduce, uh, you know, student cheating or reduce the desire of students to cheat, you know, a lot of that comes from the high pressure and high stakes assignments um, that they're getting in sort of the typical um, college, you know, class. Um, so, so revisiting that. Um, and one of the, the nice things um, that I've had the opportunity to do at Wake Forest is, is we've been building all of our classes. We're a brand new department. Um, and so all of our classes are being built from the ground up. Um, and so we, we've actually implemented a lot of these before we even went to online teaching. Um, and then we've just had to kind of tweak a, a little bit here and there in terms of, of how we're doing that. And so, for example, um, you know, I've really just embraced with my students this semester um you have the internet right you have your peers you have access to pretty much anything that you have access to at home um so we're just going to embrace that idea and i'm going to give you um some open-ended questions to answer more conceptual based as opposed to problem solving that i think kind of address the learning outcomes and you're going to work with people you're going to use the internet um and then um within that assignment um, I have uh, contribution statements. So the people who work together, just like you would for like an academic paper, right? They have to give their little contribution statement at the end. So everybody knows it's coming. It's very transparent that this is coming. Um, so they're more inclined to actively participate with their groups. Um, and then they have to give a list of citations as well. Um, so one of the things I'm curious to talk about within this discussion though is for context, my class has 37 students, right? So how do you scale something like that for a larger class? Um, and um, for other contexts, my class is, it's, a, it's a, a combo electrical engineering controls and instrumentation class. And we were just getting into system modeling when we, um, when we broke. So the actual very uh, math heavy system modeling and controls part. Um, so then how do you assess the very math heavy part of it with asking conceptual questions. Um, so, so those are the parts that I'm kind of curious to, to discuss. Um, and I can obviously, you know, give my two cents, but I'd be really interested if we could come out of this with some ideas for how to scale some of the things that I'm able to do in a smaller environment um, to a larger class. Great, thank you, Erin. And I'm sure that will prompt some great discussion uh, in just a few minutes. Raynan? Yeah. Let's go ahead and jump into your your overview and intro. Very good. Let me see if I can get a screen share. Looks like it's coming up now. <clears throat> so um, I'm uh, Dr. Raynan McClanahan. Uh, I'm a mechanical <coughs> faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Platteville. Uh, and I have a, um, a little bit of a, a different kind of take on this. 
I really enjoyed the fact that um, all three of us kind of had our own uh, perspective on this. And if I can get my screen to scroll, it seems to be frozen. I'm gonna try to stop share and reshare a second. Oh, and it is not scrolling. Um, that's okay. We may be stuck with my poor face up on the screen this entire time. Uh, but I'd like to kind of echo the words that this is a uh, global um, pandemic. We are in the middle of something that we're not used to being in. And I don't think any of us are experts on not just how to do academic integrity well at a distance, but also in the middle of everything else that's going on. Uh, so what I would like to do uh, is actually kind of lean into some of the research on uh, what makes people lie, what makes people honest, and how we can actually synthesize some different research groups, their ideas, put them together, and come up with some things that actually will help us uh, and help our students to remind themselves uh, of their better nature to be able to do better. So, oh, it finally started scrolling. Excellent. I'll throw in real quick. I'm also the uh, author of The Science of Solidarity, which is all about uh, things that I think are the most important things we could possibly be talking about from the perspective of not just an engineer uh, with industry stories, but also in the classroom. Uh, with that said, the research I'm leaning on is, is, is not from the book. So yeah, there's our global pandemic. It's a great picture. Let's move on. Question, what is it that de increases dishonest behavior and what are the things that decrease it? As academics and as engineers and in science, technology, wherever we are, whatever we teach, this is a key question. And there is good research on this. Uh, probably a lot of people are familiar with the popular work of uh, Daniel Ariely, uh, who does nothing but study this. And, and he looks at what are the causes, what causes honesty to, to increase, what causes dishonesty to uh, uh, increase, what, what, what's at stake here. And it's actually kind of uh, depressing, uh, all the things that actually can cause more dishonest behavior. And there's a very small handful of things that decrease dishonesty and increase uh, dishonesty in any situation. But just because it's a small list doesn't mean it's not important. One of those big things, one of the things that was found, it, it's so simple. Uh, and yet in the research, it's so powerful. It's getting people to remind themselves of their better nature, remind themselves of the best version of themselves getting them to right before they take an exam or something else where you need them to behave honestly, get them to do uh, an honor pledge or have some kind of moral reminder or get them to sign something before they actually take an exam, something that is going to be meaningful to them. Our students are stressed. They're worried that they're not understanding things the same way uh, as they did online. And when you're stressed and you're worried and you're tired, you're not always connecting your behavior now to the person you want to be out in the future. And so the other side of this, uh, taking uh, Ariely's work and combining it with one of my other favorite uh, uh, authors right now, uh, and that is uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, he looks at what is it? What are the foundations of that, that people judge things to be moral? So it's one thing to be like, you shouldn't cheat because you only hurt yourself. But someone who doesn't care about that's going to be like, okay, that's nice. That, that didn't remind me of anything that I would want to be. So what are the things that we can remind them? How do we inspire our students? How do we get them to, to remind themselves of, of their better nature? Well, that's where we can bring in a little bit of this. So on a statement that uh, students sign before they take an exam or something that's said orally by us to them to help remind them of their better nature, to help them remind them that, that we need them to be the future graduates of integrity. We have the following tools uh, and, and I'll get through this uh, uh, pretty quick here. So. Um, things that people care about is, is the care and harm for others, right? When we cheat and, and when we're dishonest, there's always a cost. This is something that it feels society sometimes forgets at times and, and, and it, it ebbs and it dips and it feels like we're in this giant dip. But there's always a cost to people, whether that is misinformation about some kind of what they should do to keep themselves safe out in the world right now uh, or whatever else. Dishonesty always comes with a cost. And the more we can remind people of this and that honesty actually matters, the more we can help inspire our students to be the, that better version. We also know that people who are high on uh, kind of like uh, uh, fairness and cheating, they might cheat, but they feel terrible about it. We've heard stories from our own department where students have been dishonest at an exam in this, in this alternate delivery mode and they're losing sleep at night. And when an instructor uh, finally talks with them about it, they're like, this is such a relief. I, I have felt terrible about this. 
and reminding them that part of this uh, being honest and, and acting in, with integrity, especially on exams, is about being able to sleep uh, ourselves at night and be able to sleep peacefully at night. There's a piece of this that's part of our responsibility to the students who have graduated before us. Companies will hire us uh, you know, as students, right? Based on the students that have come before, based on the reputation that our universities have for producing excellent graduates. And when our students can remember that this, their actions not just affect you know, the students that come after them, but it's also a reflection on everyone that came before them. It's all connected. Sometimes that can help students make that connection between my behavior now actually matters in a future. It's not just in a vacuum. Finally, we are students and we feel we're going to get like a bad grade on something, right? We, we feel like that's just not a sacrifice that maybe we can make. And yet if we can help students remember that the sacrifice of getting a lower grade, but being honest, is the sacrifice that makes us worthy to hold the trust society is going to place on us in future graduates. And that we as an institution, as a society, we depend on having a better generation than any that has come before. We need students of integrity. We need people who understand that honesty counts. And when we can do these kind of things, when we have quotes on, on uh, uh, some kind of like academic honesty statement that students sign and read before they take an exam, or if we can talk about this enough with them before they take exams, we can help remind them of their better natures. We can help help uh, them realize just how much we are counting on them to be the best versions of themselves. And we can help decrease dishonesty on our exams. I'll end with a quote. And that is simply, uh, this is the quote I like to use on my own honesty statements. And it's just this, confidence thrives on honesty, on honor, on the sacredness of obligations, on faithful protection, and on unselfish performance. Without them, it cannot live. And with that, I'll go ahead and uh, close my time here. Great, thank you, Raynan. Some great introductions and overviews, different perspectives. Uh, any questions? Nothing has come through the chat yet for, for our facilitators. Um, does anyone in the audience have a, a question or a response that they'd like to uh, begin with? Hi. Hi. Quick, quick question. I was just about to type it in. Um, would Raynan be able to share some examples of uh, honor pledges that you're particularly fond of um, so that we're not all reinventing the wheel? Yes, absolutely. I think we have a share site that's getting started for posting resources afterwards. That is correct. I'll post a link in the chat. And uh, Jose, to, to follow up on, on that, um, one of the things I was going to share as well was um, we actually had a conversation um, last year as a department in our department retreat about, you know, could we add something to even our course syllabus, right? Now, obviously, for the context of this discussion, we're kind of focused on finals. Um, but again, I think the opportunity is, is moving forward, you know, there are some be best practices and better practices we can, you know, we can get from this moving forward. Um, so one of the things I was going to share was also um, what we've talked about as a department at Wake Forest in terms of even putting these statements into, into our syllabi. Um, and then equally some of the statements that we've put on the front of, of some of our exam papers when we're in person that students, you know, physically write out um, and sign as well. I have a question. Um, I really like what you're saying, right, and particularly about the honor statement. But I've been at a university where there was an honor statement required to be on the front of every exam and written in syllabi. Um, it became it got to the point that many many students were simply they flip to the first page, sign the honor statement, go into the exam. It wasn't a thoughtful motion. Um, and it really became to the point if you're going to cheat, you can sign all, you can sign your name. It, you know, it didn't matter to them. How do we make, how do we ensure that it matters, that they read it, that they contemplate it? I 
have a few thoughts on that, but I'd be curious to hear what, what anyone else uh, might have to say. Uh, we know from some of the work that's done in the science of, of attention, what keeps people's attention, what, what captures their attention in the first place, is things have to stand out. They have to be a little bit different. Uh, if, if I show them the same, uh, if I say the same thing for the five, first five minutes of every lecture, students like uh, just say, well, that five minutes, I don't have to listen to him because I know what he's going to say. Uh, I don't even have to think about it. Uh, if we can make our, our statements either a little bit unusual or unique or add some pictures to it or talk about it in a different way each time we give an exam you know, for a given section, if we can get them to, to actually wake up and pay attention and be like, okay, I'm having to put these pieces together in my mind again, I believe that would help. This is systematically, I mean, there's a lot of examples you can look at. For example, Caltech runs on a very strict honor code um, that is student run, uh, and they've published a lot of data, some surprising and maybe a little upsetting on how students um, function under that. They, I know back when I was there, a lot of grad students admitted to cheating despite the honor code being something that was student proctored and could get you kicked out of school. Um, there's, uh, we, we should look them up. There are a bunch of different papers on honor codes in engineering schools. Um, I know we, we, we've discussed them at our university as well. Um, we're a little lucky in that we are a mission-based university with all of our students required to take a class on ethics. So there's a lot of touch points that we can then pull from. Um, I, again, I would, I, would, I would just say what, one thing is that thinking for the future and thinking for now um, in terms of just getting our students through the semester, this might be, I think it's a, we're like, in some ways, a fortunate thing is it's fairly easy to call on our better natures during a situation like this because I think our students are seeing all the ways that engineers can help during this crisis. Um, that it could be a bit much to, to really try to create a department-wide honor system now for the end of the semester, but rather a statement like Rainin's or even in a class, making it clear to students that we know they're stressed and that we're there to help. Um, I think that, that touch point of like, look, I don't want you to feel like you have to cheat on this. I know there's a lot going on right now. Reach out, let's get through this together. Um, I, think, I think that may actually work for the semester. Yeah, and I, I think to echo uh, what Anne Marie was saying, and I, I know that doesn't address your issue or your question exactly, um, but but yeah. So so I guess going back to the original statement, I was at a university that every piece of coursework a student turned in, they had to turn it in with a cover sheet with the same exact honor statement that every student across the university, engineer, business, dance, whatever they you know it was that same thing, and it, and it was it, it was just a sign it real quick, staple it, and they didn't even, you know, they didn't even read what they were signing. And actually what it became was a, a, a way for the university to then almost catch people out, right? So that if they were caught cheating, oh, you signed the honor code, you know, you said you knew what you were doing. Um, and so, so it became sort of a, it was used for not the intent that it was it was made for. Um, but I think especially, uh, you know, with what Anne-Marie was saying in, in the circumstances that we're in, you know, we look at the drivers of why people cheat and it's pressure, right? It's stress. Um, and these are, are, you know, students are experiencing that already. And now they're in, you know, they're in this environment. Um, we're in this environment, right? So, you know, some of our stresses may even be, um, you know, it, subsequently getting put off onto our students. Um, and so, so we have a lot of those drivers that are escalated in this environment, but then the things that help that are students who feel connected, students who feel supported, students who feel encouraged are less likely to cheat. Um, so, you know, real easy win here is if you have been doing asynchronous teaching, right, um, where you've posted videos and that's all your students have seen of you, you know, do something live with them um, before, you know, gearing them up for the exam, you know, have those open office hours, let them see you, let them connect with you. Um, and, um, and, and then connect to if you are going to put a statement in there, you know, make it a group statement, you know, what are, you know, have the students come up with what it is they're agreeing to abide by right with the with the rules, you know, um, and then they've created it for themselves. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question in the chat uh, for our co-facilitators and perhaps anyone else uh, on the call who has experience with CHEG. 
This semester, uh, this is from Laura Slane. This semester, we are making a lot more accommodations for student situations by giving extended times on exams. And she's curious what uh, experience others have had. I use Chug to get answers for things I don't know how to do, so. <laughs> um, uh, so just like, just going with my gut on this one and then I'll leave it open to everybody else. Um, I've purposely just made my own questions for things um, that don't have, like you Google all day, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna find the answer to it. Um, but that can, can, I, know, can I comment? Sorry, I don't mean that because you can, I'm talking about the tutors. Um, you can make your own exam problems too. Oh, 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 the tutors. Answer uh, for you. So if I could add, we had a challenge just recently at Vanderbilt University where a faculty member made her own questions, gave the, um, take home exam, a student posted the questions to Chegg, um, and Chegg's pretty quick in giving answers. And, uh, but the good news is, is that uh, if you um, ask Chegg, uh, they will open up an honor, um, honor code investigation and they will uh, reveal to you who posted the question. It was not in my class, but I can I can second that that we've had a similar situation in engineering at St. Thomas and Chegg worked closely with those professors and they were able to give the names and information of who used those test questions. There's more sites than just Chegg though out there. There's probably too many for us to track them all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One, I guess one idea, and it 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 has scaling problems if we're teaching big classes, um, but it addresses both the student kind of stress. Uh, and also kind of eliminates the ability of students to go on Chegg and get an answer within 30 minutes. Uh, and that is uh, having some kind of alternate type of assessment. Uh, as facilitators, we talked a little bit about this as we were coming into this. One of the things that I like to do um, is I'll assign a group presentation in which they're investigating something. And then during that presentation, I'll ask them, well, Bob, what about this? When the RPMs on this pump goes up, what is going to happen to the efficiency based on what you're, you've investigated in this situation? And if he doesn't have a good answer, um, I can start giving him hints. And it takes longer to administrate this, right? It might be 30 minutes to an hour for five students, but the grading is done instantly. There's virtually no ability of students to be able to go on to Chegg and, and type in a uh, question real quick and try to get a conceptual answer. And it helps us to assess, do our students actually know anything in a platform that makes it very hard for them to, to get around um, uh, and, and cheat. Okay, I have a comment to add. Um, I'm Abdul Awini. I'm a teaching assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. So um, for us here, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of scale, um, given the number of students we're teaching. And it's also an issue of um, integrity, definitely. And I, in fact, there are a number of faculty from you U of I here just because we're very interested in this. So for me, what I, what I changed, we use this um, kind of home built system called Prairie Learn for online assessment. Um, and before I only allow my students to uh, have a cheat sheet. Um, so I announce a cheat sheet competition where students post cheat sheets and then students vote on which one they're gonna use in the exam. And then we have this uh, computer based testing facility where students just walk in like they're doing a GRE exam or uh, you know, they walk in and we don't have to, to manage anything in terms of um, exam logistics. Now with the crisis, things change, but the, we're lucky because we can still use Prairie for online assessment. So, okay, what is the plan now? I can't just have the students do the exam in a, in a three days period, right? Or four days period. So my plans switch to changing, um, you know, um, as Renan said, changing my assessments in a way that will make my students more engaged with the assignment. Uh, Prairie Learn also allow me to create several versions for the same question. So even if you decided to team up with your, uh, again, I mean, we have international students using different kinds of platforms to communicate, right? I mean, you cannot just, they're using WeChat, they're using Viber, they're using WhatsApp. You never know what they're actually using to communicate. So you, it's, it's, it's not easy for us to kind of control this. So the idea is just to uh, have a synchronous exam where they all do it at the same time, have multiple versions of the same questions, and then make the exam hard and lengthy. I, I heard the opposite where some faculty said, yeah, let's just give, give them more time. 
to be honest, for integrity, I could kind of try to make the exam in a way that they finish on time, or they may not even finish on time, but then curve the exam rate um, so that you account for the fact that your questions may actually take longer. And this is not to add stress, but it's just to kind of communicate this with your students early and tell them that don't worry even if you're not able to finish the entire exam. Um, just because, you know, that's, this is my only way of trying to make sure that students are not cheating. Because if I use the same questions I used before the crisis, before this pandemic, I mean, I could, students can easily Google stuff and, and communicate and find answers. So I, I have to change my assessment. Yeah. But to build on something, Abdu says, but also a comment that Jessica made in the chat about the, the students feeling added pressure to cheat because of high stakes assignments and are there any tactics to reduce the stakes and spread them out? Um, which I think is a great question is, what are we really trying to assess with high stakes test assessments? Uh, and do they really match what we're trying to train our students for in terms of time tests? And I use time tests, but I also use a ton of projects. And yes, it takes forever to grade them. But there is in the K-12 realm, there is lots of research and discussion on how we assess student learning and is it outcomes based versus is it is it, is it these are the things we want a student to be able to accomplish by the end of a semester um, and actually the current platform gives us this our current crisis gives us an opportunity to think about skills based assessment um, which is if your goal is to have students hit a certain be able to do a certain number of things does putting them in a high stress assessment test situation make sense as a way to to achieve those and you know we talk a lot about embracing failure we've heard that with the entrepreneurial mindset but often we give them one test and then it's it um, and it takes more time but what if you allow students to keep taking a test until they are comfortable with their performance different questions um, that is actually something i have done with my freshman classes where they can retake an exam they have to meet with me first during an office hour and go over the questions they got wrong and then take it again but it takes off the pressure of that this is the one shot I have in an hour, an arbitrary amount of time to finish something. Um, where instead it's these are the things by the end of the semester I need you to prove to me that you can do. Um, and yes, it is, it is more, it is more taxing. Uh, it does take a lot more time. But to me, it felt more authentic with the education pedagogy research um, that if we want, if students, if we accept that all students learn a little bit differently, then putting them in a high pressure test exam situation does that really model what we want them to do when they leave? Is that what engineering really is? Um, and so playing with project-based assessment or being allowed to retake tests, again, not just taking it at a whim, but actually meeting with a tutor or meeting with a professor to go through what they got wrong and then taking it again, you know, proving that they have, they have hit these objectives by the end of a semester. Um, so trying to answer a little bit to Jessica's comment, but that's one thing I have done in my engineering classes, um, both at lower levels and higher levels. And um, uh, I guess a similar sort of um, idea uh, from Anne-Marie for Jessica's comment um, about the kind of the high stakes assignments and, and things like that. So, um, and again, th this may be an issue of scale, right? So, so I'd be curious to see how this, you know, how, how we could scale these things. Um, but something that I've always done, so I've had, I've taught a class where we've had no exams. Um, it was all projects and, and scaffolded assignments that they do a piece, they get some feedback, then they do the next piece, and then they do, you know, um, and it is, it's a ton of grading. Um, that was a class of about, I had, we had over 70 enrolled at a time, um, but then I had a, a subgroup, a half of that, you know, with me. Um, and then uh, the classes where I have had exams, I've always given resubmissions um, at the at the midterm. Um, so if we did a midterm exam, um, we, we do resubmissions, and I don't tell them that's coming, uh, because if everybody does really well on it, then there's no need to, do, you know, there's no need to do it. But if it, if it looks like, especially there's one particular problem or one area that I think like, oh, they didn't quite get that, um, you know, we, I, I let them resubmit that. Um, and I've, I've done different models where it's for full credit, where it's for half credit. Um, I've done it where we've sort of negotiated, you know, what do you guys think is a fair amount of points you're allowed to resubmit for, mm -hmm. you know, those sort of things. Um, and then I've also broken up finals. Um, we've done, uh, last semester, we did a three-part final. Now, it about killed us reading it. So I'll, <laughs> but, but it was an instrumentation course. So we did a practical part, which was worth 25%. Um, and that was, they had to come in and debug 
um, a system and then and and give us some outputs. Um, there was and they did that with their lab partner. Um, there was a take home research project that they then had to write a uh, a web page assignment for and we graded the web page on their on, on the content but also on how the web page looked um, and they peer reviewed those before they submitted them um, and then there was the sit down in class during our final time and take a final um, it's a three hour block that we have to do the final and i make sure that the fastest like i've i've made the content so that the fastest student can finish it in an hour um, so then that way any students that i have with special accommodations who get time and a half um, aren't sat there for five hours um, and i'm not sat there for five hours either which is beneficial but um uh so so that's how we've sort of in the past scaffolded it. This, this semester, or this semester, we've still done a two part final where part of it was a take home. They had a week to do things. They could work with whoever, use the internet. And then we had that second part, which was a, they log into our learning environment. They have, you know, an hour. They could probably get it done in 20 minutes though, if they, you know, if they're, if they're with it. Um, and, and then that was, uh, we adjusted the percentages accordingly. Like we basically said, whichever part you do better on, that's worth 60 and the other part's worth 40. Um, and we're doing that for each individual student for this semester. Uh, this is Gudel Zamadi from Clarkson University. I, I wanna say certainly I agree that, you know, I mean, um, the grades should not depend on a, a couple of exams. I mean, in certainly my courses, that's 30, 40 years I've been teaching is, I move toward mostly project efforts and, you know, basically what they can learn that they can actually use. And uh, so that essentially reduces the pressure on, on cheating, hopefully a little, uh, but still there are some, some temp temp temptation and so on. And I want to raise actually a question <laughs> to, the, to the audience. Uh, if a solution can be found in a on, on the web page or in gig or somewhere else uh, why should the student work so hard to learn it we want to think about that i think when i went to school there was no internet there was nothing like that we had to essentially memorize tables as an engineer but nowadays everything is on internet but our system of evaluation have not changed that much in the last at least 30, 40 years or more. So really we need to give some thought about how we're gonna evaluate uh, you know, students, even you know, if the pandemic goes away. Thanks. So, so that's a good argument for using projects instead of exams. If they're open-ended, the project, because we're, we're not teaching them information things they can look up. We're teaching them skills exactly. and, uh, and mindset, of course, that was, that was for you, Jennifer. Um, so, so we, we, you know, I, we spend a lot of time right now talking about exams, but I mean, do we, do we really want to continue giving exams if we're going to be doing this non in-person teaching? And I don't think that's the way to go. Um, I've, I'm, I'm doing both right now. I've, I've got, I've got students, taken some short exams, um, which I posted over in the chat, and I know a lot of you are doing that instead of big, long exams. And simultaneously, they're doing small team projects and, and small emphasizing teams, not the project. The project themselves encompasses multiple chapters of the textbook, but the teams are twos and threes so that, so that everybody stays involved. We're using breakout rooms and chat, and, and they're learning a lot more on the projects. They're retaining that information and they can't cheat because it's completely open-ended. Every project is gonna have slightly different answers. Um, so I think, I think that's our big way to, to tackle this. If you have to convert your classes like we did within like a few days time. And Andy, I would build on that. I, I agree with you a lot. There's also a hard truth. I'm very fortunate that I've been co-teaching with some education colleagues for the last decade. And so I've, I've had to crash course in education. And something that, you know, I had to realize that I think all of us have to realize at some point too, is do we actually know how to write a good test? Um, how many of us, let's be honest, how many of us, and I, I would love to do this poll, how many of you ever took an actual education class on assessment and rubrics and course design? Um, and I know here in the Keen group, there's quite a few of you that have. 
And, but it's honestly been one of the hardest things for me as an engineering professor is that sometimes we have these make or break assessments and they're given by people that have never taken any formal education training. Um, I, I spent a lot of my time in K-12 classrooms and I have to admit kind of unpopularly, I was at a faculty meeting once where a colleague said that students have to learn that they're not in high school anymore. And I looked at them and said, you are entirely correct. And I feel so sorry for them because the PK through 12 teachers were all accredited, all took psychology rubric assessment and, and training and student teaching. And they're stuck with us now. So yeah, you're right. Um, it apparently wasn't what that person was trying to say to me, but it was a wake up call to me a little bit. Of, it, it made me very, very conscious that I have to be very careful on my test designs and assuming that I can write a test that really does a good job of assessing a student if I haven't trained with people who have spent years and years learning how to assess and what course design is. Um, you know, honestly, one of the luckiest things that I've been counting my stars on for the last three, well, eight weeks now, is that three years ago, I was asked to teach one of my classes online. And to teach online, our university requires us, when we're not in crisis mode, to work with an instructional designer who is trained in course development and assessment. And everything I was teaching in that engineering design class for teachers had to go through twice daily, twice weekly meetings for three months, making sure that I was matching how I taught with what my course goals were in my assessments. And it was a huge wake up call for me um, and really has impacted a lot of my teaching for the last three years. So honestly, some of my giving of projects and letting students retake tests is a admission on my part that I might not be able to write a really good, good test. So, so, so the, the point that um, information is different than it used to be. Information used to be hard for, fought for and now information is free, right? But still, I wouldn't, as, in, as somebody who may hire engineers, I wouldn't want to hire an engineer whose method of acquiring uh, information is to post it on Chegg and get a tutor's input because that student isn't going to be understanding the answer. He's not going to have, he or she isn't going to have the engineering insight to do design or be creative. And uh, my, my favorite assessment in any of my courses is for an instrumentation course where I give them as much time as they need, really a week and a half to do a take home exam, open book, open notes. The only thing is they have to write down what resources are using and they're not allowed to actively ask for any help. And so in other words, they're functioning like engineers, right? If I was on an engineering project, I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't use every possible resource that I could to make sure I'm right. And how do we instill this in our students and come up with fair assessments that, that give them the tools that everyday engineers use, but don't try to sneak shoddy practice by? Thank you, Scott. I appreciate you adding in your your thoughts and there's a lot going on in the in the chat as well. I think we've got a, a few different uh, concurrent um, conversations going. So I, I want to break in with uh, one of the questions that came up. There's two that are being addressed in chat as well. So anyone who wants to share their thoughts, uh, what are your thoughts on group exams and then also a question on e proctoring services. Um, and whether or not anyone has experience with those. So anyone want to jump in? Could, could I just suggest us starting with the e-proctoring services? Because I feel like we could go down a rabbit hole with the group exam thing. So that might. <laughs> Sounds great, Erin. Thanks. What was the question that we want to look at? Yeah, this is David uh, from uh, the University of Ottawa. We're trying to put a program formally online and we're really wrestling with the idea of trying to assure the academic integrity of the exams that we're going to be posting. And we're aware of e-proctoring services like TOPAT where you can uh, watch students and we're wondering, and, and there are concerns that have been expressed about privacy of information and so on. So I was just wondering uh, among the group here, have you experimented with e-proctoring services or has your university um, established any policy uh, with respect to their use? Uh, I have no experience with them. Hmm. 
my university does use some of those services, but I am unaware of any um, any sort of protocol that they have in place for it because I haven't personally had to use any of it. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I think we have we have contracted with one of the providers, which where you have to basically make all your assessments on like the whiteboard or blackboard app. But uh, there is no policy in terms of uh, forcing us to use it or things like that. So I'm not aware of any policy in place. So. I know that proctoring services uh, can be really hard on students since they don't have uh, great internet connections. Some of them don't have good quality webcams. And some of the services require that you put sheets up over your, uh, your, your windows, over the doors. You have to show them the entire room. There can't be anything written anywhere. Um, if someone's making too much noise in the room over, uh, that can cause uh, the person monitoring to mark the student as, as defaulting. If an internet connection goes out, uh, as it seems to be constantly going out uh, for our students, that can cause them to not be able to actually even complete the exam. Um, they're probably helpful in some areas, uh, but our students have to have a good uh, internet connection um, and a lot of pieces have to come together for them, which we may not have that right now. Rain, and I'll, I'll add to that, that a lot of them, they, they can't even like move their head to the side. Like they have to be in this space and that added bit of stress is like insane. So I, I don't want to go anywhere near using those. Okay, thanks all, that's good input, thank you. Great, thank you. Erin, I know at the beginning you mentioned some questions about scaling and uh, addressing heavy calculation. Did, uh, throughout the conversation, uh, did you, pick up on uh, any suggestions or tips or any other questions that you want to throw out for a discussion? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess because I, um, before coming to Wake Forest, um, I taught at institutions where my class sizes varied anywhere from, you know, 180 to, you know, 300 students, um, maybe broke across sections, but I was ultimately responsible for, you know, that, that many assessments. Um, and so this is the first time that I've really had the opportunity to teach in an environment where I'm looking in the numbers of, you know, 20 to 30. Um, and it has changed the way that I've, I've dealt with, you know, asking test questions, right? Like I, I don't give any, you know, nothing's multiple choice anymore. Everything's, you know, open-ended, do a lot more projects, a lot more iteration. So things like the resubmissions and, and things like that. Um, and so, and I, I constantly have it in the back of my head. Well, how would I have done this? you know, with 300 students, you know, how could I have tweaked this to work for 300 students? And, I, and I've had ideas for it, but I haven't actually had to put it in practice. So I don't know if they're good ideas or not. Um, and I know a lot of our, you know, keen partners are at, you know, bigger institutions as well. So, um, or have potentially bigger sections, you know, than, than I would have. So I was, you know, I'm, I'm curious about that. So like one of the ideas we had thrown out with multiple choice tests was, you know, you could you can have a multiple choice test, but then if you get the multiple choice question right, that's sort of half credit, right? The other half credit comes from saying like uploading your work um, that's due maybe like in uh, you know thirty minutes or an hour afterwards, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to look at every single one of them, right? But just to get like a general gist of okay, you've completed the work. Um, and you have to do it in a time frame that obviously you didn't go back and then and then you know write it all up. Um, so that was an idea that got thrown out on how to you know use the multiple choice avenue, um, but then you know have that that uh, way of assessing their understanding. Um, but I think um, I I also because um, uh, Deborah you had put in the that you you liked Anne Marie's point about the training. Um, so I have this like 
it's I, I, the same thing. Like, I just find it astounding that, you know, you get a PhD and then it's like, all right, go teach 300 people. And you're like, wait, what? Um, and my mom's a fifth grade teacher. So I, you know, and we moved every two, three years and every state we moved to, she had to get another accreditation, another accreditation to teach 10 year olds. And here I am, you know, teaching people that are paying 70 grand a year right and like i can just do it um, and it just seems sort of silly so I, I just wanted to point out that some of the things that um i'm gonna post in our, in the forum um, are things from our center for advancement of teaching and i would heavily recommend if you haven't i mean i know every university has something like this and i know a lot of us really don't have the time to engage with those places the way that we you know we should um, but i would have you heavily recommend if you haven't you know, looking at your own university's resources, but I'll also post the links to some of the stuff that, that my university um, has provided within the Center for uh, Advancement of Teaching um, that just talks about things like signature assignments, low stakes assignments. Um, there's a specific blog post on, um, uh, you know, exams and um, integrity and all of that. So, um, so I'll, I'll put those on the forum. I, I'm assuming that those of you out there that have really large sections of a class with hundreds of people still have available your teaching assistants. And I, I would I would think that you can work out a strategy amongst all of you to like kind of split up the load to the best of your abilities. If you are doing some exams where you have their Zoom cameras on and such, break that into two or three sessions with, with one proctor per. Um, if you're, you know, if you're still doing projects like you did before, you'll have to break up that grading load. Just have a super, super consistent rubric so that everybody's grading it the same. Um, but, you know, I, I would think that most of the same practices will apply, um, just in a very different setting. Yeah, we do have those resources. Uh, but unfortunately, with students in so many different time zones these days, um, it gets really complicated to arrange that. Um, the uh, com the computer-based testing facility we have on campus is actually working out a plan to, to staff people. They don't have to be the TA for the course to do exactly what you just said, Andy. Um, but the, still, the time zone is, I, I think, is a problem. Yeah, I, I was thinking, so for example, um, this. Uh, this Friday, we've got all our final presentations for our senior projects. And so because of time constraints, we had to um, split that up um, into multiple Zoom sessions. Each Zoom session is at the exact same time as the class period normally would have been, but we just split up what instructor is in which Zoom session. So we're still, you know, e even though, yes, people have kind of dispersed back to their hometowns and you know, I've got students in Spain and elsewhere that are on this weird time change. They, they, they understand to a, to a certain extent that we, I, you know, I have to keep honoring that class time because that's for the majority of the students. Um, so we're still sticking with our Friday at 3 p.m. thing, you know. Um, so, and then I assume with any teaching assistants you have, um, you know, same thing, that you're not actually setting up like separate sessions with the students at different times, but all at the same time. Um, you can't schedule two Zoom meetings like through your account at the same time because you can only be one at once. So you'd have to have them set them up separate. So those are little things to watch out for. All right, thank you, Andy. All right, we're coming into the last few minutes. I, I want to thank everyone who's been sharing questions and resources in the chat. If there's a, a final question that has been posted that I didn't get to, or someone needs to um, kind of throw a question out to the facilitators, that would be great. We'll take one more question. All right, Jennifer, sounds like- this is oh. This is Thor. I was just uh, thinking about a call we had a couple weeks ago, uh, and it seemed to kind of connect with a couple of the conversations that we're just having and um, where 
I think it was Ann Satterbach, if I'm not mistaken, from Duke University was mentioning how she has employed a subset of students to basically be her sounding board before she deploys what you know something to her entire class <laughs> and and it seems like something so simple but to reach out you know she found that the students were more than willing and interested in the serve in that capacity it was essentially an honor to them to serve in that capacity it gave her real quote-unquote customer feedback before she tried something that was a little bit different um, and then got a you know onslaught of questions from her students and so that might be another thing to kind of consider or think about as your designing things that are very different from what you've been doing in the past uh, and trying things that maybe you've maybe always wanted to try, but didn't have the opportunity. And, you know, whether wherever you fall, it's probably not a bad practice to think through or, or to uh, employ in some way. I, and, um, Thor, th thanks for that. And then thanks for the, uh, the addition of the ninjas. Great acronym. I love a good acronym. Um, I, I spend most of my grant writing time thinking of acronyms for them, but anyway. Um, so uh, w one sort of, I guess, like an easier idea of that to implement um, isn't necessarily as a sounding board, but one of the things I did with my, with my class this semester when we switched to this virtual environment was let them know, like, look guys, I know, you know, you guys are scattered all over the world. I've got international students, different time zones. I'm not gonna be available as soon as you need you, know, you need this. Um, so we, we put some forums up um, and as you know, a forum is only as good as its, you know, as its participants. Um, and so I basically just offered up, you know, a point of extra credit for questions and answers. So if we got a question and answer pair, that pair each got a, you know, an extra credit point. Um, and so I actually just went went onto the forum uh, on Friday because our semester ended and I divvied out, I think it was something like 37, 38 extra credit in points of pa pairs, pairs of points. Um, so the students were sort of, you know, given, given that task and then the incentive was obviously this extra credit. And I say extra credit, had we been in person, they would have been getting like a participation mark every day for the lab part. And so this was just a way that we could kind of, you know, do that, but also be equitable across time zones. And, and then I didn't have to be available 24 hours a day either. That's a great point. One other thing that came up in an, another call was the, and I think it taps into this as well, is the engagement of alumni. And I know that this is something that I've been engaged in with my alma mater. Um, you know, think about people who have, gone before in these classes that you're teaching and maybe could serve in some of that capacity. Um, you know, we have no problems reaching out to our alumni base and asking them for financial resources. Um, but many of them would actually be really interested in, in engaging with you and in, in, in donating time um, as well. So don't forget about them as you're trying to figure out, you know, how to engage and connect with your students as well. Thank you, Thor. All right, for our last couple of minutes, uh, co-facilitators, Anne-Marie, Raynan, and Erin, any final thoughts to share? Go ahead, Anne-Marie. You know, I, I'm honestly, part of me just wants to say like, good luck to everybody. Like ever, we're kind of making this up as we go along. I guess one positive lining is that it's making us think about lots of aspects of our teaching that we might have taken for granted for a while. And you know, I know that regardless of what format I go back to teaching in in the fall um, and even this summer, I I am learning things through this experience that, that you know maybe we don't go back to things exactly as we've done. Maybe there actually are some takeaways from doing things online that might be useful in the future, even if we go back to students learning in their normal modalities for our universities. I'm not sure I'd have any last words of wisdom, but I do appreciate everyone's thoughts here. I've listed several ideas that I know I'm going to be exploring um, just from this conversation. So thanks everyone for sharing. Yeah, I would also promote that this is a great opportunity for us to do some research. Um, and since we're in the midst of this, we probably need to meet again and discuss other ideas and see how everyone is doing. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yes, everyone. and and I. 
have uh, we'll have the forum post uh, with the video and the the resources shared in the chat log in the virtual online learning subnet. I shared a link over in the side on the chat, and that's an, a great place for people to start a conversation. And you can call others in uh, to continue any additional conversations that you might want to have on this topic. All right, everyone, thank you for joining. Thank you to our, our co-facilitators. We really appreciate you uh, helping guide this conversation. So have a wonderful day. And as Anne-Marie said, good luck and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.